Hello and welcome to today's webinar about imaging dynamic processes at the nanoscale. I am Johannes Kind. I have been active in high-speed AFM research and development for over 10 years now and had the joy of participating in this exciting field from early technology development at the Hansper Group at UC Santa Barbara through roles in technology development and engineering at Vico Metrology, which is now part of Bruker, up to my current work in exploring, together with our academic and industrial collaborators, the new possibilities enabled by faster AFM. Since the invention of the AFM, improving its productivity and scientific capability by increasing its fundamental speed of operation has always been one of the field's greatest goals and one of its greatest challenges. The work I am presenting today is the research and development that has been conducted in laboratories of the AFM group at Bruker in order to meet the challenge of productive high-speed AFM. What is high-speed AFM? There have been many different embodiments of high-speed AFM systems, mostly by various academic groups. Typically, these efforts were aimed at specific research goals for example, looking at the dynamics of biomolecules and the direct observation of molecular dynamics. The example shown on the left is from the group of Professor Toshio Ando at Kanazawa University in Japan. What you are seeing is a movie of walking myosin molecules. This fairly famous movie is an example of high-speed AFM at work and was recorded with 7 frames per second. The movie on the right shows the response of E. coli bacteria to antimicrobial peptide and was recorded by Georg Fantner at MIT, now professor at EPFL in Lausanne. There are several other groups both in STM and AFM who have worked on different aspects of faster AFM imaging. To observe diffusion of atoms on an atomic lattice to enable high-speed AFM with regular scan ranges of tens of microns or to utilize the additional speed for a more intuitive exploration of the sample. All of these efforts have shown a path toward faster AFM imaging, each focusing on a different specific aspect. However, while being important pioneering work, none of these efforts by itself has led to a broad adoption of high-speed AFM. When you approach a new technology, like faster AFM, as a company, you have to ask yourself pretty early on, who will benefit from this? We were looking for areas of AFM use that would most benefit or even be enabled by faster AFM. The graph on the left side shows what we came up with. The areas that most benefit from faster AFM are of course the ones that are most limited by AFM speed. The biggest area here, which we will call survey, is the very general use of the AFM to explore an unknown heterogeneous sample, to quickly understand the significant morphologies and finally take publication quality images to represent these. In this situation, typically most time is spent on covering enough of the sample to get a thorough understanding of what is representative, before recording the final publication data. Speeding up this exploration increases AFM productivity to where it becomes a general sample exploration tool on the nanoscale. The second area, screening, is typically more industrial. Screening means the measurement of multiple samples of a similar, typically well understood class of samples and quantification for nanoscale parameters like roughness, material, property distribution, number of phases, etc. as a function of a parameter of sample creation like constituent ratio, temperature, cooling rate and so on. The final results here are not the images gathered but a graph that relates the measured nanoscale property to the varied sample parameter. The third area, dynamics, is probably the most academically established high-speed AFM application. In dynamics, the speed of the AFM is used to time-resolve a change of the sample over time. Today, 
we will focus on this last area of applications enabled by higher AFM bandwidth dynamics. We have already seen two examples of dynamics on the last slide. Now let's talk about bandwidth. Many different ways have been used to describe the speed improvements in AFM. Frames per second, lines per second, cantilever resonance frequencies, laser spot sizes. All these are related to increasing the speed of AFM. However, they can also be confusing. From normal AFM we know that the maximum imaging speed can depend greatly on the sample, the mode, scan size and set point, and the image quality. We find the most comprehensive way to compare AFM speed is to compare, for any specific sample, the same mode, the same scan size and the same tip sample interaction force and the same image quality. How much faster can I image on one system than on the other? We call this ratio the improvement in imaging bandwidth. Now let's better understand how this improvement in bandwidth is achieved. The AFM consists of a feedback loop consisting of a probe that interacts with and responds to the sample surface, a feedback controller, high voltage amplifier and a piezo actuator. This feedback loop maintains the probe surface interaction at a constant level, while rest are scanning the sample surface. Each component has a characteristic transfer function, which defines how fast this individual component can perform in the feedback loop. Taken together, these individual component transfer functions set the full system transfer function, the performance of the whole feedback loop for disturbances of different frequency. Here you see a measured full system transfer function of a pretty good standard AFM in red and the full system transfer function of the fast scan system in blue. Both start out flat for low frequencies and eventually roll off for high frequencies. However, the full system transfer function of the fast scan system rolls off at about 10 to 20 times higher frequency. So this is the improvement in imaging bandwidth that we can expect at the same image quality and the same level of force control. All academic efforts to build faster AFM have recognized the AFM probe as a key element one needs to address to increase imaging bandwidth. Concurrent development of faster AFM and affordable high yield commercial probes has probably been one of the main bottlenecks to the broad adoption of high speed AFM. For most imaging modes the first resonance frequency is the bandwidth limiting characteristic. The resonance frequency depends on the spring constant and the mass, so to increase it one can increase the spring constant or decrease the mass. Increasing the spring constant would be at odds with our goal to maintain imaging force. So we need to reduce the mass and that means to make the cantilever smaller. Another way to increase the bandwidth is to increase the dampening of the cantilever so that it settles in fewer cycles after a change in tip sample interaction. This will also increase tip sample interaction force. We can offset this by further softening the cantilever. One effect is linear while the other goes by the square root so we can still win this way. By a combination of these changes the Bruker fast scan probes achieve an improvement in bandwidth of greater than 10x for a given application. Three different varieties are available to cover tapping mode in air and in fluid as well as peak force tapping. Contact mode is limited by the contact resonance, not by the first resonance of the cantilever. So it is not as critically limited by the available probes. Another key element that needs to be revised to enable higher imaging speeds is the Z-actuator. This has often been achieved simply by reducing the Z-scan range, which was acceptable on AFM specifically designed for a single molecule work. To enable a broad range of applications, various properties of other Z-scanners need to be retained, such as a reasonably long travel and integrated low-noise position sensing,
In addition, the Z-Scanner needs to be fluid resistant and cleanable for fluid experiments. The FastScan Z-Scanner maintains a range of over 3 microns, with a first resonance more than 10 times above that of a standard system. The FastScan system is a tip scanning AFM. Sample scanning AFM are constrained in sample size and mass to be able to move them around. This situation is aggravated when scanning fast. The fastest sample scanning AFMs use sample sizes of less than 1 mm. The tip scanning design does not constrain sample size and mass, and the mass of the probes is small and predictable. In this case, the Z-Scanner also needs to provide for easy probe exchange and firmly clamp the probe to drive it at megahertz frequencies. Another key element for faster AFM imaging is the XY scanner, even though it is not part of the actual AFM feedback loop. The sample needs to be scanned at increased line rates without exciting mechanical scanner resonances. To make the system a versatile metrology tool, a large scan range and good flatness must be retained. The FastScan Z scanner is a development based on a patented design from Paul Hensmer's group at UC Santa Barbara and has a bow of only 3 nanometers over its 30 micron scan range. When we hear about high speed AFM, we often hear about frames per second imaging. As we have just seen, the fast scan system using fast scan probes has an increase in imaging bandwidth on the order of 20x, and even the most extreme pioneering efforts have gone beyond that only by a small factor. Traditional AFM images at 512 by 512 pixel resolution and optimal quality typically run one line per second, or 8.5 minutes per frame. Going 20 times faster means completing an image in 25 seconds. It becomes apparent that something else was done to achieve multiple frame per second. The answer is that high-speed AFM at frame per second speeds is always a combination of bandwidth improvement and sacrifice of data content and quality. When time resolving a process is the goal, this can be entirely acceptable. Another way to think of it is that in the days before HDTV, the quality of TV was quite acceptable, while the quality of a frozen frame was not. This slide illustrated this trade-off. The first image on the left shows imaging of casein fibrils at the de facto standard resolution and scan rate of 512 by 512 pixels and one line per second. The second frame shows the bandwidth increase achieved by building a fast AFM with fast actuators, controller and small cantilevers. The third, fourth and fifth frame show different resolution and quality versus speed trade-offs, leading to 20 frames per minute, 1 frame per second and 12 frames per second. Since the sample self-assembled case in fibrils in air is static, for the 12th frame per second movie to show anything at all, I just leaned on the AFM head from one side and then the other to generate some movement. All of the data shown here are actual dimension fast scan data, imaged at these speeds. Interestingly, all of them look pretty good. So where's the trade-off? Here we see the same series again but this time with magnification of a small area of the image. Now the differences in data quality become apparent. It is important to remember, however, how this barely bothered us earlier. The question is what the purpose of a measurement is. What would not be acceptable for a high resolution image may be entirely sufficient for following a nanoscale process. To illustrate, this graph shows the trade-off of frame rate versus number of lines for these pieces of data. Number of lines was just one of the parameters traded, next to pixels per line and loss in sharpness. It shows how the first big leap is achieved by building a much faster AFM, while a project-specific trade-off did the rest. 
If someone had paid attention to frames per second numbers only up to now, they might reasonably ask, but isn't that cheating? I hope I can answer this question by putting two recent high-profile high-speed AFM publications onto the same graph. These are, again, the famous walking myosin data by Ando et al. and the E. coli response to antimicrobial peptide we saw in the introduction. Each was recorded with special high-speed AFM equipment. The bacteria with 256 lines, the myosin with only 40 lines per frame. So I would say the answer is it's not cheating if the leaders in the field publish high-impact articles that way. However, one condition must always be met, independent of any accepted trade-offs in image resolution and quality. Excellent force control must be maintained at all times and speeds to prevent damaging the sample or even unduly influencing the observed process. Here we see a zoom out of the area where all the previous slides movies were taken. The central area was imaged over 2000 times at 200 lines per second. No imaging window was created by the repeated interactions. Of course, this sample, while being a biosample, is also a static sample in air. So let's move on to some real examples of dynamic AFM applications. This is PHBV. It is a completely biodegradable thermoplastic polyester produced by microbial fermentation. It is being used in the market as a green polymer. Because it's biodegradable, it also has a lot of other great characteristics. It's impact resistant, it can pass the dishwasher test and hold a vibrant color, including green. The downside is that the current market price of PHBV is significantly higher than that of commodity plastics such as polyethylene or polystyrene, so it is important to study. Within its study, the formation of crystalline lamella structure eventually determines the mechanical properties and so this is important to study at the nanoscale. This movie shows a different scan view of the PHBV, still offline. It's a 5K by 5K pixel image and with it you have the luxury of being able to instantaneously pan and zoom around in the dataset in order to explore these interfaces and to see how and if the lamella join. Being able to take the 5K datasets in a reasonable time is probably the most underappreciated aspect of high-speed imaging. You can now collect all of the information in the scan area, get all the context and pan, zoom and crop into exactly the point of interest. This image here is 20 by 20 microns and taken in about 15 minutes. What you want to observe is the crystallization fronts. Here is where you get into how high-speed imaging can open new applications. This is a 1 micron by 1 micron image. 256 lines taken at 100 lines per second. The frame rate is 2.5 seconds. It's important to notice all of these specifications here because when we convert these to movies we often no longer play them in real time. What you can see here is the detail of the lamella forming as the crystallization front moves to the left. We can also see how the lamella move around and incorporate defects. The second example is of a de-wetting process of a thin polystyrene film on a hydrophobically treated silicon surface. The de-wetting is induced by heating the film above its glass transition temperature. Dynamics experiments, especially of irreversible processes, need an external trigger, so that the dynamic process being observed happens while, not before the AFM can record it. External triggers can, for example, be chemical, addition of a reagent, optical, environmental, gas or moisture, or, like in this experiment, thermal. Wetting phenomena can be found in many industrial and everyday situations. Lubrication of surfaces, the human eye, or in paint. 
The forces driving wetting and de-wetting are the effective interface potentials between the fluid and the substrate and between the fluid and air. For a homogeneous fluid layer to de-wet, the symmetry of the layer must first be broken. Three mechanisms are possible. Which one occurs depends on the driving forces, polymers, molecular weight and layer thickness. Polystyrene films of less than 100 nanometer thickness on hydrophobically treated silicon surfaces are good model systems to study de-wetting. They can be prepared under contaminant-free clean conditions with chemically pure ingredients and are simple enough to model computationally or describe analytically. The movie shows the de-wetting of a 5 nanometer polystyrene film from a hydrophobic silicon surface. The process is heat driven. The experiment was perform performed using the dimension fast scan in conjunction with the dimension heater cooler. The data was recorded with 512 lines at 22 seconds per frame. Initially the sample is heated to 55 degrees C. Now hole formation can be observed one at a time consistent with thermal nucleation. When the de-wetting process slows down, the temperature is increased to 65 degrees C and finally 75 degrees C. This experiment was performed in collaboration with a group of Karin Jacobs at the Universität des Saarlandes. To study dynamic processes, it is, in addition to the imaging speed, also important to be able to trigger and control them. The open tip scanning design makes it fundamentally easy to accommodate heaters, chambers and other devices that provide process control to the sample. This next example is about capturing liquid crystal phase transitions induced by heating and cooling. The sample is a thin film of PDES, which is in a liquid crystal state at room temperature. Siloxanes have broad application as greases, lubricants, elastomers and resins. When heated PDES transitions into a fully liquid state at its isotropization temperature of about 60 degrees C. Cooling back down, PDES undergoes two mesomorphic transitions. One from liquid to liquid crystal and the other one from liquid crystal to a solid crystal, which occurs at about minus 2 degrees C. Controlling the nanostructure of thin polymer films is crucial for many advanced applications, ranging from sensors to photo photovoltaic cells. AFM imaging can be used to study the film nanomorphology and its changes at each phase transition. Let's watch this movie. We are seeing the well-ordered and oriented crystal stru liquid crystal structure as it is being melted in the beginning. The sample was rubbed onto the silicon surface and the rubbing di direction is orienting the sample. Now as the sample is being heated up, the liquid crystal is melting. Finally, just uh, a small line of the original background structure is left. Now the sample has been cooled down and uh, re recrystallization has occurred. Some of the cigar-like structures have reformed in the same orientation as before, while much of the material has solidified without that orientation. Finally, we'll see it now again in this movie in the end. Finally, as we are cooling down the sample below minus 2 degrees C, the liquid crystal to solid crystal transition occurs and we see that in the much smaller crystal substructure. The data was taken again with the dimension fast scan system using the dimension heater cooler, broadband B probes and the imaging mode was peak force tapping. At a line rate of 8.8 .8 lines per second and uh, a resolution of 512 by 256 pixels. The movie co uh, contains a total of 60 frames recorded over 29 minutes. During cooling, 
water condensation can occur on the sample surface. This can easily be prevented just by directing a gentle stream of dry nitrogen at the sample surface. The sample was purified and provided courtesy of uh, Papkov and Makarova at the Institute of Organo Element Compounds of the Russian Academy of Sciences. We were able to observe the liquid, mesomorphic, and mesomorphic solid crystal transitions of PDES by heating the sample above 60 degrees C and below minus 2 degrees C. Condensation at low temperature could be prevented by a gentle stream of dry nitrogen at the sample surface. After recrystallization, some of the material preserved the initial orientation, while most of it did not. This is the first demonstration of high-speed AFM imaging of a cooling-induced process. Dynamic studies generally require a physical, optical, electrical or chemical trigger to start the process while imaging and to distinguish specific sample responses from non-specific sample evolution. In material science, heating and cooling while imaging enable the study of material property and morphology transitions. For chemical reactions, including all biological samples and processes, temperature control allows controlling the reaction speed over several orders of magnitude. In biology, extreme temperatures, for example below freezing, can be unphysiological, while modest temperature reduction can move the speed of a reaction into the range accessible by high-speed AFM. In material science, the response to temperature change by itself can be the process of interest. Here, a quick example of dynamic imaging in mineralization. This is a freshly cleaved calcite crystal surface in water. What we see is the dissolution of the calcite. The scan size is 3 micron. The individual crystal planes that can be seen dissolving are less than a nanometer high. Each frame was taken in 22 seconds. The overall movie consists of 490 frames. Mineralization and demineralization processes on the nanoscale are, for example, relevant as they can be used to model biomineralization processes, during which organisms control mineralization processes through protein expression and nanoscale interaction with the mineral. Similarly, dissolution, oxidation and erosion processes of inorganic solids are widely relevant for applications ranging from corrosion resistance to drug dissolution, and can often be better understood and controlled by following the process in a relevant environment on the nanoscale. Here a, dynam a dynamics example from what is probably the most classic area of high-speed AFM, single biomolecule dynamics. A movie of DNA loosely bound and diffusing on APS-treated mica was recorded at one frame per second, with a total of 2,100 frames in the movie. The sample and substrate were provided by Yuri Lubchenko at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. The next example demonstrates the fast peak force imaging of purple membrane. Purple membrane is a two-dimensional protein crystal formed by the membrane protein bacteriorhodopsin. BR consists of three identical protein chains arranged by 120 degree rotation. BR converts light into chemical energy by pumping ions across the cell membrane. High resolution imaging of membrane protein crystals like purple membrane is one of the most taxing samples for the performance of an AFM with regard to resolution and force control in fluid. The AFM image on the right from a 2008 review represents the pinnacle of a decade of membrane protein research by AFM with regard to its quality and resolution. First, let's look at the patch level.
in this movie we are seeing three larger purple membrane patches one on the left one on the right and one that is overlapping and is coming down like a waterfall into the gap between the two larger patches The first thing that happens in the movie is the separation of a small piece of this uh, overlapping patch and its integration into the left patch. Something similar occurs in this area up here. So let's watch and see. Here is the piece and here it's being integrated. Here the piece is being integrated. Now we are adding actually more bacterial drops and protein to the sample solution and we see how a lot of it accumulates on the patch surface while it is not being integrated. Evidently, the integration mechanism goes over the edge of the patch, so by sitting on the patch surface, no integration occurs. However, many of these added proteins are highly mobile. Let's follow this one. Integration, integration, addition of protein, more protein accumulates, here is one protein that is highly mobile and is moving on the surface. This data was obtained uh, with the dimension fast scan system in fluid and the broadband C cantilever and this is interesting using the peak force tapping mode in fluid at a peak force tapping frequency at, of 8 kHz. It was taken at a rate of 22 seconds per frame with a resolution of 256 by 256 pixels per frame. Coming to some high resolution work, here we are seeing the actual real time speed of the, the imaging process taken from the user interface. Now we can really see the bacterial rhodopsin lattice as it is being imaged on the on the much higher resolution scale. Interestingly this data was taken again with peak force tapping with a peak force tapping amplitude of only two nanometers. After flattening the same data we can now analyze it and we see that the resolution is truly great. In the zoom in area on the right hand side we can see the three bacteriorhodopsin domains and how they match up with the protein data bank model on the top. We can also see the FFT analysis of the area and the lower and higher order maxima in the 2D FFT representing the lattice constant as well as the substructure of the individual molecules. The central pore is also well resolved. While the quality isn't quite exactly the same as in the introduction, one has to keep in mind that this was an effort of a couple of days while the image on the first page uh, represents the best achievable performance observed over more of a decade of research. The resolution seen here is very comparable of that achievable with contact mode and uh, probably quite a bit higher than that achievable by tapping mode. However, while contact mode gives great resolution it is also very difficult to control because a very soft cantilever which is required here is at the same time a bimetallic strip and therefore the uh, control of the imaging force is very difficult. In peak force tapping the representation of zero force is uh, calibrated for each individual force curve in other words for each individual pixel of the image so force drift uh, due to thermal changes does not occur. The patch data was taken with a sample courtesy of Simon Scheuring at Institut Curie in Paris and the second piece of data was done in collaboration with Isa Medalsi from Daniel Müller's group together with Shui Ching Wu of Brugger in Santa Barbara. Coming to the final example of dynamic AFM imaging in today's webinar, we will look at bacteria being attacked by antimicrobial peptides, AMPs. 
AMPs are naturally occurring small molecular weight molecules smaller than 50 amino acid residues that are part of the innate immune response of all classes of life. With the increasing problem of antibiotic resistant bacteria and the selectivity of antimicrobial peptides for microbial cells, AMPs are now being evaluated as potential therapeutic agents. AMPs act by permeabilizing the microbial cell membrane through membrane disruption and pore formation. There are three known mechanisms. The barrel stave model, the toroidal pore model and the carpet model. In the barrel stave model, the antimicrobial peptides integrate themselves into the bacterial membrane to form a stable pore for the membrane. In the carpet model, the AMPs lead uh, directly to micellization of the membrane, while in the toroidal pore model, initially the antimicrobial peptides push in the membrane head groups to form pores before finally also leading to the micellization of the bacterial cell membrane. In previous studies, the antimicrobial peptide CM15 had been used. CM15 acts through the toroidal pore model. This same peptide had also been used by Fantner et al. and had been published in a high-speed AFM study in 2009 in Nature Nanotechnology. First we will look at the action of CM15 on the bacteria as a whole. Three live E. coli bacteria imaged by fast scan in fluid can be seen in the movie. Taken at 18 seconds per frame with 150 kilohertz 0.3 newton per meter and only 8 micron wide cantilever with EBD tip from Nanotools in Munich. These cantilevers are fairly pricey, approximately 200 euros apiece but the data shows that running experimental cantilevers smaller than our fast scan probes is definitely possible. The data shown is phase, which contrasts the changes more clearly. The cells were exposed to 10 micrograms per milliliter CM15, which is known to be the minimum effective dose. A number of studies by different groups using AFM to investigate the effects of various AMPs on live bacterial cells have observed similar dramatic changes to cell morphology with increase in roughness and corrugation of the cell surface. It is important to note, however, that these previous studies were conducted at typical scan rates used for AFM imaging bacteria, 1 Hz or less, and as such were only able to obtain images at longer time scales, like several minutes, after AMP exposure. While this AFM data has provided valuable insights that are essentially unattainable by other techniques, we are still only seeing discrete snapshots at intermediate points along the time course of AM AMP activity. Similar to what Fandler et al. were able to demonstrate using high-speed AFM imaging, with FastScan we are now able to directly observe the dynamic effects of CM15 within seconds after exposure and capture the changes occurring on the cell surface at 18 seconds per frame. Fandner et al. had shown that morphological changes occur at different times for individual bacteria. This can be clearly seen in the movie. First, the left bacteria is affected. Then, in quick succession, the right and the bottom bacteria show morphological changes. These differences in the onset of changes for different cells may not be detected at slower scan rates. This slide and the next probably show the most exciting data in this story. This is a high resolution scan of the bacteria surface, showing ordered structure consistent with a bacterial S layer which has only recently been reported on live cells by Dupre et al. at the lab of Yves Defresne. 
Typically, this kind of resolution is achieved on excised membrane patches or reconstituted model membrane, rather than on live cell surfaces. It is possible that the high aspect ratio and hydrophobicity of the EBD tips was the enabling factor here. Now watch the time series of the bacteria surface at this resolution. This movie consists of 45 frames, each taken within only 8 seconds. The data shows the roughening and disruption of the S layer in response to the CM15. This is consistent with the toroidal pore model, from which we expect eventual micellization of the cell membrane. The delay between CM15 exposure and onset of cell surface roughness increase can be seen in the synchronized graph on top. This control experiment shows the bacteria before and after taking the previously shown high resolution data. The changes occurred homogeneously across the entire bacteria surface, not just the 300 nanometer scan window. This shows that the changes were induced by the CM15 and were neither induced nor significantly accelerated by the AFM imaging process. The data also permits another observation. The CM15 exposed cell is smaller. This is in agreement with SEM's observations by Hartmann et al. However, SEM observation requires fixation, while AFM permits nanometer precision size measurement on a live cell, before and after exposure. The SEM study raised the possibility that CM15 exposed cells are inhibited in their growth. The AFM data clearly shows that a live cell exposed to CM15 undergoes shrinkage. To summarize, we were able to repeat the recent literature observations of bacterial death in response to antimicrobial peptide by high-speed AFM and the observation of S-layer type structure on the bacteria surface. The combination of the two is a scientific first. Conclusions High-speed AFM imaging of sample dynamics enables a better understanding and new science across various disciplines, including polymer science, molecular and microbial biology. The Dimension Fast Scan system has demonstrated imaging performance similar to recent high-speed AFM research. The Dimension Fast Scan also has unique advantages for these applications. Tip scanning enables unrestricted sample size and provides space for process control accessories. Peak force tapping enables the highest resolution and superior imaging force immunity to thermal changes. And the Dimension Fast Scan provides the productivity of a latest generation AFM designed for a broad range of applications. Thank you for your attention.